Space dynamics for hadrons. Okay, thanks for the organizer for the opportunity to show the work we are developing in our group with many colleagues and students and postdocs. And uh, the, the, the point of, of this presentation is just the Minkowski space structure of hadrons. This is the, I mean, intention in the future. Uh, I will show some results for the pion, but uh, they are still very simplified model. But essentially, the big point of all this study is to develop methods in continuum QCD, but in Minkowski space. So far, what we have seen is calculations in the Euclidean space. And uh, observables like parton distributions are uh, intrinsically defined in Minkowski space, and we need that. And the idea of this effort is to work directly in Minkowski space and solve schwinger dyson equations, beat Salpeter for two and three body. They, I don't need to explain why they are important. And uh, with that, of course, we can go to part on distribution, space-like and space-like is trivial, but time-like observables. And uh, in such a way, we can relate to the uh, light front Fox space decomposition. Uh, if we get the, the, the bits of Peter amplitude, I will mention that, with the light front Fox space decomposition of the wave function. No? And of course, the different terms will give uh, rise to the, to the part on distributions. No? And there is, of course, this, this is an important point is the inversion problem, Euclidean, no? Minkowski to Euclidean. That is easy once you know the analytic structure and back. I will just touch this problem. OK, so the idea, for example, here I'm just putting some observables like uh, that give rise to the deeply virtual Compton scattering. So in which way we can think those things? So here, for example, we have a meson, can think of a pion, and this is the bits of Peter amplitude, quark dressed, photon dressed, and so on. No? So if we know those blobs, of course, this is not complete. We know uh, it, it's possible to exchange gluons uh, here and there. No? But in the... Uh, uh, deeply virtual uh, limit, of course, we can uh, have the, uh, I mean, the higher twist uh, contributions are suppressed. So now the idea, what are the ingredients that we, we see here? So this is the dressed quark and the bits of Peter amplitude. So these are the points I want to speak. This is, for example, the nucleon case. You know? So we have here the bits of Peter amplitude for the three body. Of course, once we know these bits of Peter amplitude, we can get this fragmentation function and so on. No? Uh, there are models in the based on Ambusion and Lacinio, for example, that get these uh, quantities. But we could uh, build it uh, knowing the uh, bits of Peter amplitude in Minkowski space. OK, so the Schwinger Dyson, I don't need to explain already how the colleagues before touched it, so the idea is to solve this equation, but now in Minkowski space, how we do that? So that is already uh, uh, efforts done by Sauli, I mean, uh, quite some time ago, and uh, uh, solving uh, this kind of equation for a very simplified model, I would say, uh, QED-like. QED so we have here, for example, a photon, and here bare vertex, so you could try to solve. And this is enough complicated. Of course, I don't need to, to insist that solving this equation have chirosymmetry break and so on. That is already seen in lattice, and there are so many uh, important phenomenological consequences. OK, so the idea, I will explain what is our effort going to the point. So this is the, I guess, this is the pro quark propagator, or the fermion propagator. I will look, focus on a QED-like theory. And uh, we have here a mass. Here are the two, uh, the two functions that you can have. 
So this is the scalar self-energy, and this is the vector part, and here one. Like, of course, we can sum. And uh, if we look in this QED-like theory, in this case, we allow a mass for this particle. In QCD, of course, people saw that the gluon propagator can saturate at low momentum, so this is like a mass. So we have here a vector particle uh, with, with a mass, and this is just in a general gauge. So we will look, I will show you um, some uh, formulation that, that we uh, look for psi to simplify the equation between zero and one. Essentially, we interpolate between Landau gauge and Feynman gauge. Okay, so this is the equation, it's very simple, and we regulate, this is just the pauli villar regulator, and we want it to be more simple, so uh, the, the simplest case possible. So the focus will be the analytic structure. How do we solve that? So we solve this uh, writing down uh, what we call, uh, could be a Kalan lemma, you say, rep integral representation for uh, the two terms in the self-energy, or in general, this would be a Denakanishi integral representation that is more general than the, this integral representation that you can use, and soon I am going to use, in the, to describe the bits of Peter amplitude. So now uh, we have to rewrite the schwinger dyson equations in terms of these two spectral densities, A and B. And uh, once we do that, all this analytic structure will disappear. So we will, we will not uh, be worried anymore in taking care of these uh, cuts here. They will be already taken care when we formulate that. So, and the idea to solve it is very simple. It's just based on the Feynman trick. We insert this in the schwinger dyson equation and uh, just use Feynman trick. And then there is an important point that uh, Nakanishi uh, stressed, is the uniqueness of this representation that he proved at the, pertur uh, at the perturbative level. And if you use this ingredient, you assume that it's valid at the non-perturbative level, you can re really write down uh, equations that are, at least in this model, that are not too difficult probably to solve. Okay, so how we get? Uh, we have also, we cannot forget also that we have to write uh, the, the, the propagator, the fermion propagator, in terms of the, also of an integral representation, and we have the vector part and the scalar part. And we, uh, this quantity is the vector. Here I just wrote for the vector part. We can relate to these densities of the, of the self-energy. This is important because we write down the schwinger dyson equation. The integrand has the uh, uh, fermion propagator. So this is just to give you an idea how it's not that hard to get that. So this is just an algebraic equation. And those quantities are just principal values. Okay, so this is just giving the general flavor of that. And I, I really, I don't want to enter in too much detail, but just to give the general flavor that this seems really possible you know, so, uh, that, uh, to do. You know? And then now, uh, with that, we can write uh, two uh, integral equations for the spectral density. This is for the vector part of the self-energy and in terms of the vector part of the uh, propagator. And we have a kernel. And here, this, we have two terms, we see here, and then the contribution from the regulator. And this is what softens this integral equation. And this is the kernel. You can, using this, so Feynman trick, or uh, that is the Feynman parametrization plus uh, uniqueness of the integral representation, you are able to write down uh, this uh, equation, integral equation. What is that? Yeah. Oh, I think it's vanishing this. Yes. 
So you have the kernel, no? and of course we have to take care of the support, and this is the analytic form of the kernel. So in principle you can write it. What is the M sigma? M sigma is the mass of this uh, vector particle. That's all, yes, yes, of the exchange particle, that's all. No, so, and, yes, yes, we didn't, no, we didn't put self-energy in the sense you are thinking. So this is the most simple case. The only complexity is different gauges and a mass for the vector particle, and then solve the, yeah. so this is the complex. And this is nice that is at this level already we can see the threshold for these two spectral densities that Gaston already called our attention, and this dependent on the gauge. And to simplify, to arrive in this form, we assume, as I mentioned, that psi is positive between zero and one, because everything we did analytically here. And indeed, you see that the threshold for the vector part depends on, on the gauge, while the, the, for the scalar part, is just... Uh, just that, no? Okay, so this is what we are doing now at this moment, and numerical calculations are underway. Okay, uh, now uh, we made, uh, the idea is to try. We have the, once we have the, um, uh, the Minkowski solution, we can explore the complex plane for those self-energies. On the other side, for the same model, we could rotate back from the Euclidean to the Minkowski direction. So this was the suggestion by Peter Maris. He already did that, and we just rotated back. So calculated A and B for the same model. So in this case, Euclidean is pi over two, Minkowski is t equals zero, and then you can compute the solution of this equation as a function of theta. And this is what has been done. And the intention at some point is to compare those solutions with the ones we get. And so you can see here is the B over A. So this is the mass term as a function of the angles, you see. And then uh, what we have, this alpha is not too large, and we just have a mass. This is just the mass, the shift of the mass, you see from, in this case, from 0 0.5 in arbitrary units to, to 0 0.7. And this is just the Schwinger function that you, from the slope, you can get the mass. Okay, but you can do a little bit more on that. For example, I just want to call your attention. So this is the imaginary part of the mass that is essentially the imaginary part of the B, sorry, of the B, is the spectral density. No? And then you can see really the effect of the threshold here. And this is the threshold we derived before for this, uh, for this uh, spectral density. No? Of course, you have to, to go to even smaller angle to see here that this function is zero below the threshold and then it starts at some point. Okay, so you can also look to the mass function. And here we made a little exercise. So this was the computation of the mass function in, uh, for p squared space-like. We, we, we wrote Euclidean. And then uh, we could get, uh, for different angles, we could get the imaginary part of the self-energy. And indeed, when we use the, the integral representation, when the angle is very small, we go to very small angle, we really approach the uh, solution in Euclidean space. Okay, so this is what we got. We are at this point now, and the idea is to compare uh, both methods, the one we get solution in Minkowski space, and this uh, rotation. Now, the next point that we solved uh, using integral representation is the two boson bound state, two body bound state, using this idea of the Nakanishi integral representation. So this is the bits of Peter amplitude. And we write, this is for convenience, this is power three. 
but we can use Power 4 or so on, doesn't matter. No, this is for convenience that you can easily understand. If you have two propagators in the bits of Peter amplitude, and you just use the Feynman trick, you have power two. So power three, you have still some dependence for the vertex. So this is natural to use that. Okay, this, so this was introduced by Kosak and Williams. They have success in solving uh, the bits of Peter ladder for bosons. And uh, this was further elaborated by Carbonell and Karmanov, where they allied this technique to the light front projection and matched uh, the, the valence wave function. Okay, so just to connect with this, uh, the bits of Peter amplitude with the, with the light front wave function, I just remind you that the light front wave function is defined on this hyperplane uh, tangent to the light cone, that is x plus equals zero, and then you can relate the valence wave function just by projecting the bits of Peter amplitude on this hyperplane. This will be the valence. And uh, this was uh, the idea from, uh, to use this projection to simplify the equations for the uh, uh, weight, Nakanishi weight function. Okay, and how the valence appears is just in integrating K minus, and this is the, in the case of the two boson, you have here this weight, Nakanishi weight function, and you have this square. And this gamma here, is term, is just the transverse momentum to the square, and this variable Z is related to the Bjork and X between zero and one. And this, of course, in this kind of method, one, one quantity that we can get is the valence probability we can compute. And of course, from this we can have, for example, the valence, uh, the, 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 the PDF, no, the valence PDF, if you like. Okay, but now is interesting uh, how using this projection, how, why mathematically is correct the uniqueness? Is because, I just want to call your attention, there is a theorem that you can invert that formula. It's the, uh, it still just transform. And this is mathematically proven that you can invert. And this we just explore, show it that in this, in, in, in this work that this allow you to get equations like the ones that Kusak and Williams got. So this you unify. Okay, so now you, you, I will show very briefly some results solving uh, the, for the solution of this uh, ladder bits of Peter. So this is uh, bosons without, uh, I mean, this is uh, just the three propagators, and this is the kind of equations that you solve. No? And once you solve, you can again get the Euclidean bits of Peter amplitude and compare, because in principle, you can, you have just a cut in the real axis, so you can rotate this to the complex axis of K0. So you can do this rotation. And indeed, we made uh, some game with a student of Lauro, Gutierrez, some time ago, and these are the solution we computed for this model, the ground and excited states, and this is what we call transverse amplitude. This is just the transverse amplitude. No? We compared it, I mean, I, I forget to mention. We compared the Euclidean solution, this worked fine. And also we compared this transverse amplitude that you can both compute having the valence wave function and, and the Euclidean here, and the Euclidean bits of Peter amplitude. And you see these are two independent calculations, and you see that the matching, this is the excited state, ground state, and so on. So the match is perfect. So the method really works. And then here, now we did the same, uh, we've tried to follow the same idea, making a rotation in the complex plane coming from the uh, Euclidean uh, equation to the Minkowski uh, equation with Peter, so this is, we just put in the, in the archive, and then um, using that, that rotation here, essentially, so for theta, 
equal pi over 2 u r on the complex axis, and t equals 0 is the Minkowski one. And this is just the kind of, this is the vertex function, not the bits of Peter amplitude, but it's the same, it's just the vertex function. And then you see continuous lights and dot lines, they match us. And these peaks are just on the, the where the uh, support of these gamma functions, of the Nakanishi weight function appear, where you have the singularity. So you can derive this exactly, and this is already derived in the paper by Kusaka and Williams. And then you can see all the structure. Okay, and this is more, I mean, you can compute in the time-like momentum, so this is for very, very small angles. It's not easy, these calculations numerically. You can go to the space like, and here you can see how the beautiful analytic stretch, and this is coming from, the, from this rotation. No? Okay, so now let us talk a little bit to a real application that some of you already seen that. So is to solve the problem of fermion anti fermion in the zero minus state that this is in principle is our pile. So we made a very uh, simple module where we have constituent quarks, Feynman gauge, and we use a vertex to regulate the, the, this equation. So we have a form factor because it is known that this kind of equation, ladder and um, undressed particles, they have scale invariance. And if you try to make a very strong, strongly bound uh, particle, it, the equation will be, the solutions will be unstable. And uh, so we need uh, to include form factors. Okay, so how we solve? We, we write each of the invariants of the bits of Peter Ampli, and they are four in this case, in terms of the Anakanishi representation, because they are just scalars, as in the boson case, and then we just plug this representation in the integral equation and solve it. Using the light front projection, we must be careful because there are endpoint singularities that were already treated by our colleague, uh, Pacheco, many years ago, and also even before by Young. And we have to take care of that. I, I just put here just to remember. But you can. You can do that. And uh, with that, you can solve, you arrive at uh, integral equations that you can reuse basis expansion for that in both variables, gamma and Z, and we can look. And this is the kind of weight function. Right? Here I'm just putting for the scalar boson exchange uh, some example that how they look like. No, it's not something. Uh, <laughs> has some structure, but them itself are not observables. They have no interpretation. It's only to see as a reference. What is interesting is to look at uh, momentum distribution, form factors, and so on. So now we make a mock pile model. We use uh, a quark mass of around 200 MeV, cutoffs of about uh, 200, 300, 400, uh, something like that, and a gloom effective mass. No? This is in Landau gauge, but our calculations are in Feynman gauge. Okay, so these are this uh, uh, projection of each of these uh, components of the bits of Peter amplitude. With these parameters, we have a f pi of 150. So we tuned, because now we wanted to look at, for example, momentum distribution and valence probability and also form factor. So we tuned that. I will show soon. So we can get in our calculations the valence probability. And of course, the, in this case, of a spin one half, uh, uh, this two fermion case that you have uh, uh, zero minus, you have two valence amplitudes, now that you can see, two of them written here, one here and another here. And of course, if you normalize the bits of Peter amplitude, you can get the balance probability. And here are some examples. We have to retune the coupling constant to get the pi mass, 
and this is for different quark mass, gluon mass, and the, the, the valence probability, as we expect, is uh, not so big, no? After all, the pion is strongly bound. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, valence uh, distributions. In this psi is just the Bjork and X that you expect. But of course, the dynamics, if you play with the gluon mass and so on, you affect it. So this is just the transverse uh, distribution. You know? So this gamma here is k per square. So this has this kind of polynomial uh, power law behavior. And these are uh, now, we just tuned parameters to provide an f pi close to the empirical value. And then uh, we have a valence probability about 70%. And these are the four amplitudes that I mentioned before projected to the light front. Okay, and then we computed the form factor, but at this moment only using the valence component. And uh, we have, of course, remember that the valence probability is about 68%, so we had to renormalize it, and this is the kind of comparison we have. So we wonder what are the, uh, the um, the contributions of the higher four components, because even this model have higher four components. The higher four components in this case are QQ bar, vector meson, QQ bar, two vector meson, and so on. So these are the higher four components in this model. And this is the kind of, just to see that we are, at least looks, or the pion is so enough simple to allow this kind of, of solution. Next, I have uh, how many seconds? I don't know. Four Let minutes. me check. Have four minutes. Four minutes. Oh, okay. So I just want to show a little bit about the three body that we also solved uh, a simple model that is a kind of zero range interaction that we have. That this is the uh, four dimensional equation. So recently we solved this model in Euclidean space and also in Minkowski space to compare solutions. Uh, so this model is, is simple to solve no? in doing the uh, rotation to the Euclidean space. And the nice thing that we could solve this model just for the valence component, making a light form projection, and also, I mean, in four dimension in the Euclidean space. And the solutions, this is the mass, as a function of the scattering length, because the input of this model is just the scattering length. And you see a huge difference. So this is a ground state. So this is the mass of the bound state. Uh, we have, of course, the continuum here at nine, because it's three times the mass. This is for negative scattering length. And here we have the first excited state. And you see a huge difference. Why is that? This is uh, already understood that we neglect when we project on the, just to the valence uh, Fox sector, we miss all the higher Fox components on, on the kernel. And in, in the three-body case, this is really important. Now, uh, you, we can compute also these transverse amplitudes because they are the same. Uh, both in Minkowski and Euclidean space, so this is an example. And this is the difference between the light front case and the bits of Peter uh, solution that we know the difference. And we fix it here, the binding energy, but even though you see uh, a lot of difference. And this has to do with the contributions of the higher four components. And this is just uh, was our last work on that. Then we solve it, the that same equations in using subtractions, but fully in Minkowski space to take care of the i epsilons and principal value. And of course, this is the amplitude. You see a lot of structure that there are many, many cuts that we have to take care, but it's doable. And this will just, uh, will just appear in PLB. And uh, this is the transverse amplitude for one of the FADF components. And we have compared the Euclidean solution to the Minkowski one. And of, uh, in this case, we take the modules. And uh, I mean, the method 
for, you see, we have here uh, three orders of magnitudes or two orders of magnitudes, and it seems to work. So this is one example. OK, so this is what we have, models very simple. So we use the integral representation to solve Dyson-Schwinger equation in different gauges. We make unvig rotation, maybe it's a promising tool, when allied to integral representations. No? We can apply this uh, integral representation for bosonic, fermionic. No? But we have to be careful with this light front singularity so if you use this method of projection. We also look at the three body case, to the three boson case, and compare the demand. Why this is important? Of course, this is, at some point is our nuclear on that. But there are many things to do. No? Uh, we have really to go. We saw uh, what Christian showed us today about self-energy, quark gluon vertex. We really have to, to use uh, ingredients as much as we can from lattice QCD. But the point is that how to go to Minkowski. And of course, there are many things to do. And just thank you. Questions? Less of a question than a okay. suggestion. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you this already before. When you go beyond, right, you have this exchange of this particle. You just wrote that. I want to do more that comes from lattice. Now, for instance, you know very well the lattice propagator from QCD. You could easily fit them with one complex conjugate pole model, right? And then you have two poles. You know exactly where they are. Could you put this in your kernel and then do the no, but this is the point. What you are calling the attention is that if you use this complex structure, we, we destroy the, the two-body continuum. And uh, this maybe is what Christian was uh, maybe pointing out to me with this complex structure in the morning. I don't know if it was that. But if, if you, you destroy that is a, this is an important point on how to bring this is stretch because we, we need this pole on the real axis. Yes, of course, because those equations with these integral representations in the way they are, the cuts are in the real axis. Mm -hmm. So you, you miss those structures. So the question is, QCD supports, that I don't know how to answer, integral representation in the standard way or not? Because if it doesn't support even many approaches where people use Nakanishi representation to, to get information from, for the uh, parton distributions, for example, yeah. they will be questionable. But one thing you can demonstrate, if, if you like algebra. I, I will just finish the, the point to, to. You can demonstrate, and this is not difficult, Suppose you get a co this idea. This is why I'm telling you. You, so you get, for example, the gluon propagator using this gribov zonziger uh, ansatz with the poles outside. Could yeah. be also the quarks. Using Feynman trick, yeah. you can demonstrate that your uh, bits of Peter amplitude is not possible to be represented with a cut in the real axis because this will pollute just by the Feynman trick. It's not more than that. You can demonstrate that. So there is a question. Does QCD and, and allows this integral representation or not? And then it gets even worse, right? If you wanted to use something like Maristandi, how would you do this? <laughs> Maristandi is phenomenological. Yeah, the point is to use something like Chris. No, but <laughs> yes. I don't know what Christian yeah. thinks. I don't think. I mean, yeah, it should have cuts and, 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 and poles on, no, on the yeah. complex X, not only on the real. <laughs> It's hard to say whether they survive a full calculation, but the fact is any beyond rainbow ladder calculation that, that we've done so far, including this 3PI thing that I talked about this morning, has complex conjugate poles in the quark, and yeah. that's what happens. Yeah, but then the point is how we go back. How do we define the parton distributions with that? At some point, we'll have to ask that. I know that there are practical solutions, I think. I saw the paper sure. by, by uh, uh, Craig Roberts. 
It has a very nice paper on that, but this is a practical tool where you fit an Akanishi integral representation to the Euclidean bits of Peter amplitude. But you are assuming that this is true. But if you do exactly on that, you just, the most simple case, complex poles, Feynman trick, insert in the bits of Peter equation, you get that the bits of Peter amplitude, you have uh, singularities on the complex plane. I mean, in this way, you can demonstrate that. And then uh, where we stand? But, but, but you don't see this in the Euclidean. No, no, because, of right? course. And because then you I'm assume from the very beginning that the Euclidean should actually match Kovsky, then some Yeah, but the, but the point is that of, right? such kind of integral representation that comes from perturbation theory are suitable for confined theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I can tell you now, again, one point, uh, that those integral representation will lead to the scattering continuum that you don't have. This was indeed my question. And I think also what I saw from Chen Cheng, they do not have the continuum. The three board, the scattering. Yeah, the, the three quarks. For example, if you are in the nucleum, you have three quarks flying away. You, you don't have. Okay. It, yes, yes. But then those equations are. And I think possibly this is a consequence of this, um, uh, how you say, analytic structure where you put the cut on the real axis. But, okay. <laughs> if I know, I, I knew a paper that answered that. Okay, so. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> now, for the last talk of today, we have a Fabio. I have to say this name in front of many Germans, I'm afraid now. Fabio Kerp. Heavy quark had reproduction with dipole framework at FAIR. How many of you have uh, experience in phenomenology? Or almost of you are theoretical physicists or experimental physicists. So my talk may be a little boring to theoreticists and um, to the experimental physicists may be interesting. So I will talk about heavy quark hydroproduction uh, at, uh, in, within the Paul framework um, at FAIR. So this is the outline. Um, this, this part, this part um, a little motivation to, to implement the, the Paul um, formalis. And uh, next, I will talk about the, my results and the results present in the literature. Oops. So here is the introduction. Um, why to study uh, the, this kind of hydroproduction in the polyformalism? We study this kind of production to constrain the gluon distribution at low X uh, Bjorken scale, um, that is in high energy collisions. Uh, this kind of collision, uh, this kind of uh, formalism can test the prediction of perturbative QCD. And um, the, the pole formalism provides an easy way to, to calculate uh, this kind of production. Um, here, um, the, um, this formalism includes a phenomenon known as um, saturation. 
uh, in which um, prevents the gluon distribution um, grows at low X. Uh, I will show this uh, behavior in the next slides. Um, also, the dipolar models includes um, information about the unintegrated gluon distribution function. Because in ordinary part on distribution function, the um, uh, transverse momentum of gluon is integrated over transverse momentum. Um, and here, it's, uh, it's the region uh, where you are working. This workshop um, is mainly focused in this area. And um, um, the calculation that I will show next will be in this interface forward to, to the left. So here it's a brief introduction to this and uh, how do we get the proton from function structure that is related to, to F2. Uh, here we have uh, the scattering uh, between an electron and a proton. And uh, knowing this vertex from key D, it's a well-known vertex. And here it's how we, um, we will obtain obtain the um, part on distribution functions. Um, from the current uh, conservation condition, we have this uh, tensor with this form. Here I am, um, I erase the, um, the term responsible for electroweak interaction, that is the uh, F3, uh, because we are only uh, working with a virtual photon, okay? And um, calculating the new vertex from KD, taking the, this limit, we obtain this differential cross-section. Uh, if we consider the kylian gross relation, which is uh, FL equals zero, we uh, get th this expression, okay? Here is the definition of uh, the variables. And uh, we have this uh, uh, x and i vary from 0 to 1. Uh, here is the uh, total cross-section for virtual proton related to F2. And um, the, this photon has a transversal and longitudinal polarization, so we have uh, these two contribution to form F2. Uh, before to talk about the glooms, we will talk about uh, the naive quark particle model, which it doesn't include the glooms. So here we consider a, a quark uh, distribution. And here uh, we calculated from uh, KD the difference, uh, differential cross-section. Um, ah, uh, I almost forgot. Um, from this, from this kind of scattering, if you only, in principle, if you know the scattering angle and the energy, initial energy of electron and uh, the final energy of electron, uh, we can we can determine uh, F2 uh, evolving uh, deglap. Okay, so this this angle is related to scattering from from the um, final uh, final electron electron and uh, if we rewrite the can uh, change the battery
if we rewrite this, this formula, we get this one, okay? Um, I'm skipping some steps here to, because this is not the, the point, this is uh, only the motivation to um, show uh, why do we need to constrain the F2, okay? So we arise at this equation using the calendar relations. It holds because the quarks have spin one half. And um, when, you compare, when we compare this equation with uh, five, with this one, with the equation five, we obtain, sorry, we obtain the um, definition of F2 for proton. So F2 for a, a quark on part of, a naive quark part of model is the composition of the quarks from the C uh, uh, and the quarks uh, and the valence quarks. Uh, the success of the quark particle model was that uh, using the, these experiments, uh, the, they get the half the um, momentum of the proton, uh, um, which means where is the other half comes from. Uh, it provided the first indirect evidence for the existence of the gluonic components of the proton. And why we needed to, to, to have two? So this workshop, it's about mainly uh, non-perturbative KCD. So I really don't know uh, how the part distribution function uh, would be of interest. But for high energy physics, it's a fundamental piece to calculations at high energy physics. Why? Because we have this, this factorization theory. And um, here we have um, a cross-section for uh, any uh, uh, specific, uh, um, a specific process. And um, uh, this, uh, these uh, PDFs, uh, or parton distribution functions, are non-perturbative, non which means we have to, to measure them. And this is uh, calculated perturbatively in a renormalization scale in, and is related to the mass, rapidity, and center of, uh, center of uh, mass energy. So for high energy physics, the, the constraint of part on distribution functions, the, their uncertainties are very, very important. So here are some, it's not clear, but here are some well-known results from the GLAP evolution uh, for F2 in electron neutron uh, in T2 uh, evaluation. We have, uh, for different X, we have uh, Bjork in uh, scaling violation. And um, the X, it's, uh, uh, it's not calculated perturbatively, only measured. In the quark part of model, uh, only the term you are considering, it's this one, okay? When we consider the emission of a gluon with a transverse momentum, we have this term. Uh, in fact, when uh, when, you have, when we are considering looms, we have the additional these terms, okay? And uh, this this three cancels. Um, yeah, in this one, it's uh, irrelevant. 
the, the contribution is, is it's not big. So uh, why, do, why do we need uh, uh, nonlinear equations? Um, here, it's the well-known Deglap equations for, for the quarks and for the gluon evolution. And uh, we, can, uh, we can expand uh, in power series uh, the splitting functions. And uh, as we can see here, for a bigger key square, the Deglap uh, works well, uh, very, very well. But when we go to low x, when we evolve in x, uh, we need some, uh, some uh, different equations. This kind of equation incorporates the nonlinear term that will saturate, that prevents the gluon distributions to grow fast. And um, we have a, a saturation scale. Yes, two, that will depend on X. So this is the main, um, uh, I will show you in, the, in these slides, or uh, the, the previous, previous, why we need to uh, constrain the gluon distribution at low X. This is the distribution of the partons. We, here we have the valence quarks and C quarks, and here it's G divided by, uh, by 10. This grows at this scale, 20 GeV squared, grows, um, grows faster. And here in the blue line, we have this, this growth. It's called the violate unitarity. So this is why we use this nonlinear equations. And here we are looking for the regions that may be probed, probed by the LHC, uh, low X in, uh, relating to key, key 2 And um, I'm not sure where uh, uh, Farrell will be in this plot. Um, so this is uh, this in dipole picture. Um, if we take uh, the um, the dipole picture, takes the um, the, fun the photon, uh, the virtual photon, in uh, transversal and, and longitudinal uh, polarization, and um, this is the formula to fit F2 in the dipole models. This, uh, we, can, we can see here that uh, the Fermi mass, it's well known. And the uh, number of colors, uh, the constraint, constraint, um, constant of electromagnetic. Uh, and here are, where it's where we put the, the dipole models, okay? Here, uh, R, it's the scale. The the scale and R it's the distance between these two dipoles. Okay. Uh, one other question is is how to probe the proton content, and uh, here is the process we have, and uh, what information we get to our in analyzing this process. In this process, we get the gluon distribution, the quark and antiquark. And uh, here we'll get the, we probe the, the U quark, D quark. And uh, here quark and gluon. This is the region where the fair will, will probe. Okay, and now uh, we we get the dipole uh, half quark production in dipole framework. 
This kind of process is well known in part of model, and uh, we, will sh we will see that the, the results in this formalism and in Parton model, it's very similar. Here, can you change the battery? Sometimes it stops, sometimes I almost breaking the counter. Yeah, yeah, also the Okay, here is the, the total cross section for the production in PP going to quark and quark and X. Here we have the, uh, the part on distribution for the glue, and here it's the dipole model. The, um, sorry, here is the gluon, um, gluon nucleon going to to um, Kikibar X. The repeated distribution is uh, is given by this one. Uh, this uh, wave function is calculated from perturbative KCD, and uh, this uh, quark anti-quark gluon cross-section is where we, okay, it's uh, where we get the, um, where you put the dipole models. Um, here, uh, this is the main diagrams that contributes to this kind of uh, cross-section. It's the same for the partial model. And here is where we will put our models, where X is the lo uh, longitudinal momentum, and R, R, as I told you before, is the distance between the, the dipoles. Uh, in some uh, papers, uh, the authors um, uh, kept the fixed the factorization scale, and um, they changed the the value from the renormalization and the quark mass. But as I told you before, in the um, dipole models, we fit F2. So um, we choose to use the same quark mass here to eliminate um, to eliminate the this the the to eliminate the the window in quark mass. This is the um, these are the dipole models. Uh, here we have uh, the simplest one that doesn't include the impact parameter uh, in dipole related. Um, in this case, we have a, a parameter dependence inside of uh, our uh, scale of saturation. And this one, we have to evolve the gluon distribution using KCD nu, that's a, a numerical code. And um, here, we don't use this part. We consider only the gluon glue interactions. Here, we are just looking for the total cross-section of dipoles uh, in terms of R. And we see a similar behavior to BCGC and EPSAT. And uh, a clear saturation in GBW. Uh, some results. Uh, here is a, a very recent results in which they are using the Parton model uh, and uh, at next, next lead in order for bottom, uh, bottom, bot, bottom, bottom, bottom. We have, uh, we see that uh, the day results are a little, this, this results is very, very good. And this 
is a bit slower than the experimental points. Here it's a paper from Alice uh, in which these uncertainties are related to uh, scale, uh, factorization scale, mass, and um, and uh, renormalization scale. They are using the PDF CTEC uh, 6.6. .6. Here they are using this one. Here it's uh, from a Brazilian paper, uh, research. They are using our old PDF and uh, they obtain a nice result also. Here they are using this, this kind of uh, this uh, mass per button and this one for, for charm. Here is the GBW model. Uh, this one is the running coupling BK. And this one, it's the color transparency. And this is our results. Um, it's very similar with the presented in the previous slides. Here, it's an estimation from, for, for FAIR based on this article. And uh, as we told uh, by one of the speakers, in the combination phase, uh, uh, we have PP collisions. So it will be possible to test this, this, this window if this kind of uh, models could predict some reasonable results. Here it's for, for rapidity distribution at 30 GeV. Here we are comparing uh, this uh, modern PDF to an old PDF. And uh, it's, uh, in this case, there is not much difference. And here is for PP bar production. Um, also, it's very similar to the other results in part of distribution. Here, uh, this difference may be uh, due with the um, bottom mass that's very large. And uh, we, um, we can see that uh, the, this, this <laughs> the poll sh uh, uh, shown similar results. Uh, for total cross, uh, total cross section of charm, it underestimates the data. And one possible explanation is the quark mass to fit this model since the, uh, they are different from the other ones. As I told you before, the quark mass are very sensitive in this, in this kind of production. If, if we alter slightly the quark mass, we have a, a great, um, a, a great uh, a change in our results, as we can see in this LSE paper here. Here. Here they, they, they keep the facts, the mass, but uh, uh, I really don't, uh, I didn't, didn't see the mass which they used here and, and there. And um, we can see in, in these plots that at high energy, almost all the pole models converge. So we can uh, tell uh, why, uh, what of these models are good or no. The same occurs for the charm production. Only the BGBK it's different. And the same, yes, I told you about the strongly dependence on mass work. And that's it.
have already one question here. So this is from your introduction. I mean, you talked about BFKL, and you rightly said that no one really knows what happens at low energy. But um, I sort of have a question. Uh, uh, you've shown this very famous Digla plot, where uh, the data fits the EP scattering data fits very well. Um, F2, are we talking about uh, F2? Previous, previous. Uh, this one, yeah. This one in, in the top. There is no equivalent plot for BFKL regime, right? Where DIGLA breaks and BFKL fits really well. All evidence for BFKL is indirect from PP collisions, not from deep inelastic scattering. Am I correct? Yeah. Am I I'm correct? Yeah. How... How proven is the fact that, I mean, I, I, I went through these derivations many times, and they kind of always assume that energy goes to infinity, x goes to zero, mm -hmm. um, energy goes to infinity, x goes to zero, and at a certain point, even though x goes to zero, uh, you can still use perturbation theory because the Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how proven is this? Or is this something that people just think? You mean how, how we prove that uh, nonlinear equations are correct? You were... yeah. yeah. Well, I mean... This is, this is uh, one question that I put to my ex-advisor. Okay. How we can uh, be sure that big lap is wrong at yeah. low x? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I mean, DIGLAP is, wrong. DIGLAP is wrong because you have these uh, uh, collinear singularities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have these collinear singularities, and then if you do a perturbative resummation with these ladders, they disappear, and this is how you get yeah, BFKL. You can, you can... The, the but evolution. I mean, you have to assume that perturbation theory, yeah, your previous slide. The, this, this, this proves that maybe some constrain the gluon, but uh, mm -hmm. in which kind of process this is very important. Can you go to the previous slide for a second? Because you know the previous, yeah, this one here. You basically, this is where BFKL comes in. Instead of using yeah. single gluons, you have these funny ladders. Mm -hmm. And they are more divergence free. Mm -hmm. But this proves, I mean, you are essentially assuming from the beginning that perturbation theory works at asymptotically low x, asymptotically high energy. I'm just wondering how true, you know, yeah. maybe, it's, maybe it's proven and I just don't see it, but I've never seen um, an argument about it. It's a, it's a sort of, um, my models works better than yours, but... It's kind of a competition between the, the research that works with uh, part of mod, with um, standard DEGLAP mm -hmm. and with uh, those ones who works with uh, BFKL. Okay. In the different papers I never saw, uh, these results are equivalent to BFKL or vice versa. Okay. There is there, there is no uh, there is. It's uh, some sort, I like blue, do, 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 do like white, and so we can publish. Yeah. But they it's don't it, compare. They I don't mean, it's interesting that you say models, because these people say that they get everything from the QCD Lagrangian. I mean, QCD is not a model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a PhD student, so I'm not. Uh, I, I, yeah, and uh, as I told you before, I'm a phenomenologist. I'm not a ter ter theorist in uh, QCD nonlinear equations. So I'm just looking for the models, compare with the standard uh, part on models, and what we can conclude from that. And it's. <laughs> so one more question here. 
Uh, from the Panda perspective, uh, one thing which would be really important is uh, a good uh, uh, event generator or modeling of P2P going to anything which has uh, which is connected to charmonium or, or heavy flavors. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this model probably will not do that, right? It's a question. <laughs> That's a question, yeah. Because you, you showed all the results for PP, which are nice and interesting if you have heavy, uh, um, high-energy PP scattering, but this has nothing to do with Panda. So how can we translate this to proton-antiproton? Ah, good questions. Uh, I'm not so, uh, so sure because in partial model, we can, we can calculate to PP bar, but uh, in... Uh, Dipole models, I think that's only possible for PP. In this paper, oops, in the results, sorry. In this paper, uh, I have to divide the cross section of charm for the PP bar in the part of model by seven to get the to get the estimation. This estimation for charm, it's for uh, if we multiply by seven, we get to PP bar, but in part of model. Because the plot says PP. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's not a cont contradiction because one of the one of your uh, speakers uh, talk about uh, the cognition phase PP, right? We we run. I don't know if you measure them. It's yeah, More questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again and all the others from this afternoon session, and uh, we close the day. Okay, so everybody knows we can go to the restaurant tonight. I don't know. You don't? No. <laughs> but you, you I see yeah, yeah, messages. Yeah. You didn't receive an email with the instructions? I didn't see my email right now. Have a look there. Ah, okay. Please try to be there at 8 o'clock because it's a very well frequented restaurant and we don't want to stay. I'll be a bit early there. If somebody wants to have a drink with me, I'm there. That's <laughs> good. Quarter to 8 or something, 20 to 8. And uh, for those who eat their vegetables, there might even be a summer bar afterwards. <laughs> yes, it's on the phone. It's very good. It's very good, yeah. It's just a game of balasitri. It's very nice. Bro, this is shot. Try that. You will miss. The show. Melhor deixar aqui. Eu tô com. Sim. Com algum problema, melhor não confiar nele, não esperar. Tá. O senhor me manda por e-mail, mas se. É, que eu vou demorar e acabo esquecendo. Tá, se for. Tá, coloca aqui. Ah, esse de quem? Esse é o seu?
Anybody left the green USB key? No? Well, I'll leave it here.